Hi, for those of you new here, this is evolution simulation game The Sapling, my solo indie game project. It's a game where you can basically do two types of things. On the one hand, there are a number of scenarios tasking you to design an ecosystem that meets specific requirements. On the other, there is a sandbox where you can build your own plants and animals, turn on random mutations and see how they evolve. In this series, consisting of six videos, I showcase the development and content for the third big update for the game. One of the things I do to get a bit of attention for a new update is post a few links to Reddit. There are a few subreddits like Speculative Evolution, Indie Gaming and Procedural Generation where the average Redditor is interested in this type of game so the response is usually positive. For the final flight update I experimented with a few more subreddits and one of these experiments was our world building. I imagined this subreddit to be mostly for fantasy writers, D&D players and conlangers and not so much people interested in evolution so I didn't expect much of it. I was wrong. The post quickly gathered over 4000 upvotes, making it my most successful reddit submission of all time. And this got me thinking, maybe the game needs to cater a bit more to world builders and really emphasize that the game takes place in an alien ecosystem on some other planet. The more I thought of it, the more this seems to make sense. By framing something slightly differently, this could be a game not only about artificial life and speculative evolution, but also about astrobiology. I imagine the first thing I say in the full release trailer to be something like Have you ever wondered what life is like on other planets? Cool, huh? Obviously, the most important requirement to add this world-building astrobiology twist to the game is a planet editor, which I already introduced in the previous video. But there's more. For example, if you look at alien planets in movies and games, they are rarely just green. The color of the plants in No Man's Sky, for example, differs depending on the planet, and the same is true for Astroneer. Or take the plants in the alien world constructed for James Cameron's Avatar universe, which are blue, purple, pink-like. Or the speculative evolution YouTube channel Bibliridian, where the plants are red. Or the Spore remakes Creature Sim with blue grass, or Elysian Eclipse with purple plants. As you can see, this game really needs plants in other colors. The simplest approach I could have taken here is to simply add a color picker and be done with it. But I feel like there's a bit of science here that's just too good to leave out. You see, it's not just world builders who say plants on exoplanets should be other colors than just green. This is a blog by NASA about the subject. They too don't believe that plants should be green to be able to do photosynthesis and that plant color mostly depends on what light colors reach the surface. For example, on darker planets, plants might be near black to absorb as much light as possible, while on really bright planets, the plants might be near white to reflect most of the light because they can't handle that much energy. In the planet editor, you control what colors of light reach the surface by clicking these rounded squares. They need three or four of these, not less not more, so as you can see, as soon as I have only three, you get only black plants because all of the available light is absorbed. If you put all light colors on the maximum, on the other hand, the plants will need to reflect light colors to stay alive, so the plants turn white. Things become more colorful when the light is something in between. For example, if I make a planet with a lot of green light, the plants will need to absorb this color, but don't care about the rest, so you will see plants in any color that does not contain green. Interestingly, with just this system, it is not possible to create a planet where you see plants in only one color, like on Earth. For this, I added something extra, following a theory by physicists Trevor Arp and colleagues, published in Science Magazine in 2020. Their idea is that plants are green because the availability of green light on Earth is too unstable to rely on. So that's what these checkboxes are doing. If you make a light color unstable, it means the plant must reflect this color. So if I for example make red unstable, you will see the plants on my planet will be mostly red. So how does this work in the editors themselves? So far in the game, all color pickers were just one bar where you could slide from infrared to ultraviolet. This minimalism was something I was really happy with, but it had the important downside that it does not allow for darker or brighter colors. Obviously, black and white colors are really needed now, so I had to kill my darling and add an extra slider. It works for animals as well, by the way. Of course, building your own world does not only mean plant colors. We now have this whole editor where you can specify and randomize all kinds of things about your planet. For example, with this range slider I can specify the minimum and maximum deep groundwater and with this button I can randomize where the deep groundwater actually is. So with these default settings I get a lot of variation, but if I want a very dry planet I set a maximum over here and if I want a very wet planet I set a minimum over here. 
A lot of these terrain statistics are directly or indirectly influenced by the location on the planet and the shape of the terrain itself. Wind strength, for example, is influenced by the wind strength slider but also by how mountainous an area is, with the more extreme winds being above flat terrain like ocean. Shallow groundwater is influenced by the shallow groundwater slider but also by the distance from water, and the temperature is influenced by the temperature slider but also by the terrain height and the distance from the poles. This means you can have snowy mountain tops and snow at the poles and a hot desert around the equator. Speaking of snow and deserts, the latter two statistics, groundwater and temperature, are now also visualized in the soil color. I've set up the code so that I can now specify four colors, namely cold wet, cold dry, hot wet and hot dry, and the game will blend between them depending on the soil statistics. Or if the temperature goes below the freezing point, it will just be white. The interaction between latitude and terrain height means that for some larger mountains, the side facing the equator will be warmer and thus less snowy. This is a bit unrealistic, I mean, on earth I don't think we have mountains so large that you can see this effect, but I decided to leave it as is because I feel it nicely showcases how these systems interact with each other. The final world building thing and major sandbox thing I will add in this update is seasons. With the introduction of seasons there will be much more variety in what's happening in your world, but of course things will also get a bit more complex, because all life you design will need to be able to deal with all seasons in one way or the other. Seasons can be defined in the planet editor. When you turn them on, you will notice your planet starts to rotate at an angle, which is of course totally unnecessary, but I thought it was a nice touch. You can define up to 8 seasons, and for each season you specify how much warmer, colder, wetter, drier or windier it is than normal. Designing the UI for the season editor took me several weeks of iterations. I finally arrived at this design, which felt right because it allowed for a really concise summary of a season, which I could reuse as the season indicator in the actual world. This summary, for example, indicates that for this season, the temperature is slightly lower than normal, but that wind speeds are much higher than normal. The arrows I'm using here were inspired by probably the most important simulation game of all time, The Sims. So if you specify this season, let's call it season A, and then another one season B with the opposite statistics, these two will alternate. At the moment, the switch between seasons is nearly instant, so you can jump from this situation to this situation in a single day. I could change that to be much more gradual, but that would mean that any effects a season might have on the ecosystem happen later than the player might expect, which I fear might confuse them. Therefore, I decided to go for the instant season switch, so it's at least clear to everybody what is happening, but I might get back to this decision later. At this point, you might be wondering what ecosystem effects I am referring to specifically. I mean, it wouldn't make sense to implement seasons in a game about ecosystems, which you can by the way buy on Steam and Itch, but don't have plants and animals respond to it, right? I indeed have a few things to say about that. So much, actually, that I could fill a whole episode with it. You know what, let's, let's just do that. So say, for example, you built your world of purple plants and it is really hot and dry, except in season D when it suddenly is freezing cold. How will your creations survive winter? If this video made you want to play the game, you can. I aim to release the features presented in this video on the beta branch on August 16. If all works out as intended and I manage to fix the most annoying bugs, a full release will follow a month later on September 13.